Jackie Hassan as your host on this most epic journey through pop culture's past. Hold on to your butts. This is Nostalgia Theater. Brought to you by the Movie Tale Podcast. Welcome back to the show. This is Zachy, and if you are listening to this episode on the day that on the on the day that it drops, uh, it is Halloween, and what better time to celebrate the subject of this month's episode uh, of Nostalgia Theater? I'm talking about Dracula, uh, Lord of the Vampires, Prince of Lies. What are what are the other nicknames? My 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 guest is Glenn Greenberg, who who has a little bit of familiarity with Gr- Dracula, <laughs> having having uh, written his comic book escapades briefly. Yeah, uh, Prince of Darkness, uh, Master of the Undead, uh, Lord of Vampires, uh, or just the Count. You know, the... <laughs> ah, 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 ah. that's what I think of. <laughs> So, so this is this is fun. This is you know th- this is a topic that you suggested to me, and I was like, I like this. I can dig this. You know, it's like uh, Dracula is just one of one of those sort of fixtures in in not just pop culture but culture. And and you know you step you step back and look at it, and you're like, how many actors have played this character? How much longevity has this character had? And then you sort of say, why? Like, what's the secret of Dracula's long life other than drinking human blood? <laughs> Well, I think a lot of it is, well, first of all, um, I think a lot of it is just that the, that the book is just so, so damn good. Hmm. Um, the original, you know, the, the source material is just, is just so good. Um, I think one of the things that, that Bram Stoker did, uh, that was brilliant was that, you know, he made it, he made it a very timeless novel. Now it's, it's definitely of its time. But he stayed away from from making any kind of really sort of timely references. Now, obviously, the technology you know changes over the set over the one hundred plus years. But in terms of the actual book, he doesn't mention any celebrities of the time. He doesn't give any dates. So it's sort of it could it could take place at any given time um, uh, to, to a great extent. I think that was really, really smart of him. Um it's it's a classic tale of good versus evil. It's very straightforward with with you know hardy you know men who your heroes and a and a you know a, a plucky you know damsel in distress and, huh. and 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 the other thing that that I think makes Dracula so, such a timeless story is you know you can put five people in a room and each of them will come away come away thinking that it's about something else. Okay. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that if you look at the last few adaptations that have been done, um, a more a more recent one uh, had Dracula. Uh, the story it, it's a, it's an allegory for um, uh, venereal disease. I guess right. it was uh, uh, herpes or or, or uh, uh, syphilis. Um, you know, uh, other people look at it as a as a as a parable about immigration. That Dracula represents, you know, the Eastern European, you know, maybe it's the Jews or, or the gypsies or, you know, whoever uh, coming to high society and infecting, you know, uh, uh, their 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 uh, upper crust uh, world. Um, I think that's what gives it a lot of its timelessness. So so before Stoker, what was the popular conception of of a vampire did dracula break that uh break that trend or did it did it conform to to what was the the you know what people thought of generally well there there were a couple of notable notable works before that uh probably the most uh notable were uh varney the vampire which was a serialized story that was published in the penny dreadfuls huh. uh in, in the early um 1800s um, the other one, which is probably a bit more uh, influential on Stoker, was a, was a novella called Carmilla by uh, J. Sheridan Le Fanu. And Stoker pulled a lot from that story. Um, 
Stoker most notably added the the notion that the vampire can change its form, that 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 he or uh, she can become mist and control the meaner animals, uh, the, the you know the the wolves, the rodents, uh, that he can turn into a bat or a wolf. That's the stuff that 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 Stoker um, added. But for the most part, uh, the 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 common view of the vampire was it was this creature that uh, arose from its grave, uh, you, I guess at night, and, and to drink the blood of of the living. And a lot of a lot of the the, the notions that Stoker uh, included in the book were already around. Uh, I believe the notion that you had to be invited in huh. uh, came from the, came from folklore. Uh, I believe that you know that they. they you can't cr- uh, a vampire can't cross running water was something that he incorporated. Um, the notion that the vampire is destroyed in sunlight that was not in Dracula, that was not in Carmilla, uh, that was an invention of Hollywood, and I believe the first time that was employed was in the 1922 movie uh, Nosferatu. Okay, but Stoker, Stoker did a lot of research, and he he basically used a lot of what he found in his research and just added a couple of his own little spins on it. Stoker is the one who who codified the notion that a vampire is weaker during the day. That that the reason why a vampire sleeps uh, during the day is because he doesn't he or she doesn't have that, you know, uh superhuman strength uh until until after sundown. So was was the, so the book is published in like late 1800s, right? 18, 1890 18, 1897. something. Okay, eighteen ninety seven. Okay, eighteen ninety seven. So is it a hit right out the gate? I believe so. Yeah. I believe it really took the world by storm. It was. It was. Um, uh, I mean, the book has never been out of print. It's one of it's one of the only books in history, aside from like say the Bible, hmm. <laughs> that that has never been out of print. So I have to imagine that that it was. It was um, it was probably a hit from the start, and I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm like, when when did Stoker die? Stoker died, I believe, in 1912. So you know, it's like, did he did he live to see how big Dracula would become? Well, obviously not, because because at the time he didn't, you know, who who could foresee? Like Dracula as a as a movie force, a uh, hundred plus years of of success after, sure. But I mean, I mean, he yeah. he he's still in his lifetime. He got to see that that this had this had sort of been been taken up by the public. Yes, he yeah. he got to see there was a stage production, which uh, which I believe. Um, it, it was not. It was not the the uh, the the, Bal- the Balderston stage production that became the basis for the 1931 Universal film. Not right. that version. But there was a staged reading of. Uh, the, uh, it was an adaptation that was done for the stage where they had you know basically people just on a stage like just reading the script, um, and certainly um, he he knew that Dracula was popular enough that shortly before he died he prepared a collection of short stories and the name of you know what, what became the name of the collection was Dracula's guest and other stories so uh, you know as he was dying because you know he was he was ill mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that he did was prepare a, a bunch a collection of sh- short stories and one of them was Dracula's guest which was um I, there's some dispute about what Dracula's guest is whether it's a discarded chapter from the book or an early chapter that that he you know he put aside and, and went in a different direction because it doesn't really fit with the book 100%. Right. But but he he definitely knew that there was there was uh uh, uh th- that there was um demand for for more product with Dracula's name on it because because he put together Dracula's guest. Either right. that or his wife did. Okay. So, so Nosferatu, the movie, comes out in like 1921, I think. Yeah, um, 1922. 1922, and and th- that's obviously the unofficial, you know, the uh, adaptation, but it's clearly an adaptation of Dracula. Is that the first time that story is put on film? Yes, in Germany. Uh, yeah, it's the first time it was put on film, and it was a it was a German film, and Bram Stoker's widow. I'm sure you know Bram yes. Stoker's widow got wind of it. And sued, and uh, won the won the uh, the lawsuit, and all copies of that film were supposed to be destroyed. Right. Well, I'm I'm glad that they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, and obviously it was it was directed by uh, uh, F. W. Murnau and and starred Max Schreck uh, as uh, Count Orlock. But the rest of it was co- you know completely cribbed from Dracula. I, I think uh, it says something about the level of film nerdery that I was acquainted with in 1992 that I was probably the only 8th grader who got the reference uh, that Christopher Walken's character in Batman Returns is named Max Shrek. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know what that's about? And people were like, yeah. "I turn around, we're going to give you a wedgie. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> uh-huh. So so the most famous Dracula even now, obviously, is is uh, Bela Lugosi uh, for for all the, sort of the iconography that that he carries with him is still, you know, that's what people think of even now. Now, I I did not see the Lugosi movie uh, fully until two thousand and four when they released when they when uh, the movie uh, Van Helsing came out and they Universal put out all the old Universal monster movies and new new configurations. And so I sit down and I watch Dracula, the the 1930s version, and it is a slog to get through. <laughs> yeah. I mean it, it you know, I mean out of all the universal movies, I'm like this is this it's lifted up entirely by what we you know be, uh, by by Lugosi. Uh but the movie, I mean it's like watching a stage play, which is exactly what it is. Yes. I I could not agree with you more. In fact, um about two weeks ago, Sven Gulli uh, showed showed the original Dracula. Oh, nice! Uh, um, and it was actually a, a, an updated version in that I um, about I don't know a few years ago the Fran- uh, in France they put it out on DVD and they added like a musical score to it huh. to give it a little bit more juice. And that's the version that Sven Gulli showed because uh, apparently the last time he showed it it went over really well. Okay. Okay. So I sat my daughter down and I said, well, you know what? This is not one of my favorites, but it's got this musical score. Maybe it'll add some some life to it. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> and um, about 15, 20 minutes in, I said, you know, of this, I can take no more. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've never been a fan of the Lugosi film. It it, 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 it kind of offends me, actually, that that it it's basically a stage play. Um, with, with a camera in front of it. Yeah. Uh, especially because for two reasons it offends me. One is because uh, the Spanish version is, is you know, definitely a, a better filmed version. You know, yes. it's, it's, which, it's which same... by, by way of explanation, they, they yeah. shot a Spanish language version at the same time on the same sets. At night, yeah. Yes. It's sexier, it moves better, it's less, you know, Style, I guess, stylistic. I mean, to, to me, at this point, that what whether it was intended or not, the movie is camp. I mean, it's a yes. very campy movie. Um, the other thing that bothers me a lot is, you know, it was made the same year as Frankenstein. Frankenstein is a we, terrific we, movie. We, I was Frank- about to say. I mean, I mean, Frankenstein had all the same limitations, and yet it's it's amazing even now. There's no music score. Right. Uh, but you don't need it because the movie, like James, see James. This is when you talk about camp. James Whale leaned into the camp uh, from the jump, uh, whereas Dracula is accidental camp. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's why it's not effective. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. Those are those. Those are the reasons why. I mean, I'm. You know, when I when I finally saw it uh, all the way through, I was like, kind of appalled. <laughs> and. and, and 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 it gets it gets worse. I I have less and less patience for that film every time I try to watch it, just because knowing what else was going on around that time, that there's no excuse for it to be so dry and boring and and just so you know the close-ups of 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 Lugosi just kind of like scowling at the camera. It's just like you know maybe it was scary back then. I, I can't imagine audiences were that unsophisticated. Right. But but. You know, maybe they were, but it just does not work now. But I'll tell you something else. What did work for me and what and why I do think Bella was a great Dracula, Abbott and Costello me Frankenstein. I totally agree. And and, he, and yeah, uh, just just uh, to that point, I mean, uh, Bela Lugosi played uh, Dracula twice, once in Dracula in 1931. And then, you know, nearly 20 years later in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Uh, the truth is that you know that you had you had Lon Chaney in the middle there. You had you had um, 
Carradine, John Carradine. Uh, right, John Carradine. I mean, we don't we don't remember their versions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, not really. We remember Bela Lugosi. Right. Well, he was the first, and he had that accent, and he had the fingers, those tarantula leg like fingers, and you know, he he did put a lot into the role. I just didn't think he was effective the first time. Right. Whereas, you know, in um. Well, the other thing was, was he barely knew the language yeah. at, in 1931. He was struggling with it. He, he had to read everything. Um, he had to deliver the lines, I believe, you know, phonetically. Um, so he, he wasn't quite well versed with the English language yet. Whereas in uh, Abbott and Costello and Frankenstein, even though he's like about 15 years older, he's smoother. Uh, he, he's, he's more comfortable with the language. There's a charm to him. That's yeah. completely missing from the original. Um, and, you know, and even, even though he's having to deal with, you know, <laughs> Luke Costello, right. um, I'll take care of our tubby friend, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great performance. And, and, I, and I really, really enjoyed him in that one. In fact, I probably saw the, Fra- the, um, the Abbott and Costello movie first and then saw the original. And maybe that's, that kind of fueled my disappointment. I well, I'm I'm right there with you in terms of the chronology. I think I think uh, you know, Abner Costello meet Frankenstein is a movie that I watch all the time. I watch it by myself. I watch it with my kids, and and it's uh, I think I think the genius of that movie is that it works entirely as a monster mash movie within itself. So so it doesn't make yes. fun of the monsters. Right, uh, you know that you have, you know, there's there's the the hero, there's the heroine, and all. You take Bud and Lou out of it, you've got, you know, House of Frankenstein, or you know, like you've got one of those right. movies. Exactly, uh, exactly. It's it, it, yeah, it's, no, it's a, a universe great. horror movie with two idiots in it. That's exactly right, you know, and and so I think that's the reason why you can look at Lugosi in that film, and you say, well, he's playing Dracula. He's not making fun of Dracula. This isn't the right. Naked Gun, you know. Right. Yeah, I and I I thought that you know, and so and so from that movie, I get, I get the the um, the adulation and and the identification of of Lugosi with the role. Hmm. Um, if if he hadn't come back for for the Abbott and Costello movie, I I would you know, I would just be shaking my head and just thinking, you know, it's only because he's the first one that that people identify him so closely with that role because he was you know nobody here had ever really done dracula on film before so he's the first um but but it's not a great movie i don't think it's that great a performance um um and um uh i think that um you know it took 20 some odd years for for the for the real true great dracula to come along so i'm assuming you're talking about christopher lee absolutely so so before we jump to to hammer i i have you have you watched uh Son of Dracula, and uh, yeah. Um, so, so of of the secondary. I've seen them all. <laughs> okay, so of the secondary Draculas, who do you prefer? Do you do you like Lon Chaney? Do you like John Carradine? Okay, of the two, because you're giving me two really lousy choices. But uh, <laughs> of the two, I go with Carradine because, well, first of all, Lon Chaney Jr. God bless him. You know, he was great as the Wolfman. The Wolfman. Wolfman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must have been thinking of Marv. Marv uh, the Wolfman. Um, he was, he was, he was fine as the wolf man, but him as Dracula was ridiculous. Um, you know, he, he looked like a linebacker, (laughs) (laughs) you know, he was a big beefy guy. That's just not Dracula. Carradine, you know, with the mustache and the goatee, you know, the, the, the goatee and that gaunt thin, he probably captured the look of Dracula as described by Stoker, uh, far better than, you know, probably anybody else, but that he, he never conveyed that East European sort of exotic, uh, you know, that other otherness yeah. that, 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 uh, that Lugosi captured with that voice and the, 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 the accent and all that. So I would say in terms of appearance, I would say John Carradine, I just wish, I wish he, he had, you know, sort of tried to adopt a less, you know, American accent. Well, and and it is kind of intro. Yeah, the a- accent, absolutely. Um, and the- Cheney, forget about that. that <laughs> you know what's funny about Cheney is he, you know, he 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 was very proud of the fact that he had portrayed every single one of the Universal monsters. But it's like when you really think about it, the only one he truly excelled at was his own, was his baby, which was the Wolfman. 
Right. And, and, and I mean, and as I recall, yeah, he was, he was not a great Frankenstein monster or, or, um, or the mummy or you yeah, right. 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 Um, I, I, you know, and as Dracula, I mean, it seemed to me that, you know, I mean, the way I kind of accepted, accepted that, that, that he was, you know, the lead in that movie was, I mean, it's called son of Dracula. So I just assumed he was Dracula's son. I mean, to this day, right. I never accepted him as the real count Dracula. Yeah, and well, and and to that point, because the movie leaves it vague, right? I mean, I I almost feel like, I mean, they they don't clarify like what what his because other than the title, there's nothing right. in the film textually that that situates him as as Dracula's son. Yeah, there's there's nothing that or as Dracula because he's just walking around, you know, calling himself Alucard, <laughs> Alucard. you know, subtle, so, <laughs> brilliant. It's um, it's interesting though that the Universal films. You know, they got a lot of mileage out of the Frankenstein monster, but with Dracula, I mean, you had you had between Dracula and Abner and Costello meet Frankenstein, you had three if and let's let's stipulate for this that let's let's say that that Cheney was playing Dracula. You have you have Son of Dracula, uh House of Dracula and House of Frankenstein. I think that's it, right? I don't I don't think he made any other appearances. Right. Uh yeah, I mean his his corpse was in Daughter of Dracula. That's right. But that's, that's right. you know, that's that's it. And so, and so my assumption was, you know, the movie was called Daughter of Dracula, and it was about his daughter. So right. I have to figure Son of Dracula was about his son. Yeah, right. So, so, uh, so the Universal era ends, and and now I have to I have to say here, I've seen none of the the Hammer films, uh, n- neither Dracula nor Frankenstein. So this is where you uh, uh, tell me all about why Christopher Lee is is your favorite. Okay. Well, you know what? We'd be remiss if if we didn't mention that the I think it was the same year that the first Christopher Lee movie was made. There was a, a another movie called The Return of Dracula. Okay. Uh, fe- featuring an actor named Francis Letterer, which I finally got to see within the last couple of years. I'd always heard about it, but I never I never got to see it. And it kind of has the same uh, plot as a later movie called Billy the Kid Me- versus Dracula. Okay. Um, where Dracula ends up in America, uh, basically disguised, uh, posing as uh, as the man uh, uh, who who he murdered on the way over. You know, gotcha. he adopts this guy's identity and infiltrates a, a family. Um, and uh, uh, Francis Letterer was not a great Dracula, but at least he he he. There was an otherness about him that okay. that I thought worked to his advantage. Uh, but with regards to Christopher Lee, who basically blew everybody away and continues to, hmm. uh, number one, he was tall. Number one, he just had this look about him, this aristocratic look where he could he could look he could look as if he was looking upon the world with contempt. Um, he was able to convey that uh, where where he could he could sort of infiltrate the world and sort of act like one of us but he was always one step away and 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 kind of viewed humanity with a real sort of you know we're we're, we're basically here for him you know right. right um number two he was active and virile and and vital in a way Lugosi uh, never really was uh this dracula ran this Dracula, you know, g- got in in you know uh, struggles with with his opponents. He was str- he always conveyed a, 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 a an essence of of power. Um, his voice was commanding. I mean, this is a guy that you know when he said, "I'm you know I commanded nations," you believe him. You know, right. with that with that voice, um, he played off of his. You know, w- whenever they cast a good opponent, he played off of them. Very, very well, particularly Peter Cushing uh, and, and some of the subsequent uh, actors that, that, that he played opposite. He, he just he, there was there was a power and an essence. And, and you know, when he would uh, take take a female victim and he would just look into their eyes and they would like, you know, just crumble before him. You believed it, you right. know. He was a handsome man. I mean, you know, but but he was also a, a very imposing and intimidating man, and and so you totally believe him that that he could have this power over you know over women. Um, that 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 he was a a, a a a formidable force against men. He just was the whole package. He didn't always look the way 
Stoker destro- described them, but he captured the character. And that's the other thing. He really believed in that character. You know, some of his movies were, a vi- you know, lesser quality, but he never, ever gave less than his all because he, he really respected that character. Well, I mean, and and let's talk about the fact that the that the Hammer films, uh, they were in color, which was you know that was that was new for for this subject matter, and yeah. they really foregrounded the sexiness. Yep, uh, that um, was new. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, as as it went along, I mean, the, you you look at the first couple of uh, Hammer films, and they're positively chased. Uh, <laughs> I think I think that I think that what really shocked audiences at the time was it was the first time that vampires were shown with fangs. If, right. if I'm, if I remember correctly, it was the first time that that they were shot in color. So when you see the blood, I mean, it's red. I mean, audiences had not really ever seen that before. So that was that was something new. Um, by by the time you get into like you know the mid '60s, um, you're seeing a lot more cleavage, uh, a, a, a lot more uh, racy uh, under you know not undergarments, sleeping garments that the that the uh, Hammer ladies were. Uh, were uh, dressing in, um, they definitely amped up the, the sexuality, um, that, that, you know, was kind of always there, but obviously because of, you know, mores at the time, you, you really had to tone it down. Right. So, I mean, how many, how many times did, did Christopher Lee come back as Dracula? Uh, you know, I just wrote about this. I, it should be at the top of my head. I, th- I think it was seven, seven in all. Okay. Um, cause there, there was, there was, there was 80, yeah. 1972. Right. Well, there was, there was, um, there was horror of Dracula, which was the original. That was 1958. Okay. And then he refused to play the part again for eight years. Okay. Um, so they actually made a sequel without him, uh, but without even Dracula, it's called brides of Dracula. Okay. And, and Dracula's not in it and, uh, neither are his brides. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. <laughs> But but Peter Cushing is in it as Von Helsing and, and he's terrific. Um, so then uh, he, so then Christopher Lee was was coaxed back for the first se- true sequel, which was Dracula. Prince so of so Darkness. wait, so he yeah. he didn't want to do the sequel because he's like Dracula's dead. There's no reason to come back. Or no, I think I think a lot of it was he was afraid of typecasting. Okay. I think that I think that he did not want. I don't think he cared that Dracula was dead and he was trying to be, you know, uh, faithful to the, you know, essence. <laughs> I, I don't think it was that. I think it was that he he took a look at what was happening he saw he, it, what, he, with Lugosi. Exactly. I mean yeah. that that to me is probably the most fundamental reason is I don't want to I don't want to have a career like Bela Lugosi's, you know. Which I mean uh, I mean to some extent he was right to be afraid because I mean obviously he had a long and storied career, but he never shook the Dracula label. L- Lugosi or Lee? Uh, Christopher Lee. Oh, right, right, right. But I think a lot of it is because he, by taking those eight years off, he was able to do other things uh, yeah. that to establish him as as a more versatile actor. So it's not like he did the first Dracula and then went right into the second Dracula, you know, which I think Hammer would have loved. Right. Uh, he held off and was able to build a reputation for himself, so that when he was it, so when he did agree to come back. For Dra- uh, for Dracula, Prince of Darkness, it was more on his terms, you know, right. kind of like the way Karloff, you know, when Karloff finally came back for Bride of uh, Frankenstein, he was already a household name. And so if you look at the credits, it's it's not, you know, Bride of Frankenstein starring Colin Clive and, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, the guy who played Dr. Pretorius. Right. Uh, 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 Ernest, 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 Ernest Thesiger, right? You know, and, 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 and Boris Karloff as the monster. No, it was Karloff in yeah. Bride of you know, right. so I think I think to, to Chris, Christopher Lee's credit, um, he stayed away long enough that by the time he came back, he wasn't he, he wasn't any in, in any position that he had to worry about being typecast as Dracula. Well, and, and clearly, I mean, he, he enjoyed coming back enough that he, he kept coming back. Well, I, I don't I wouldn't say it was enjoying. I think it was, <laughs> you know, he, he was. He, he, you know, and this is him. This is the way he described it. Uh, was you know, every time he thought he walked away for the last time, Hammer would you know come you know calling again, and they would really sort of g- put a guilt trip on him. They would hmm. say, you know, Chris, you know, the Dracula movies are what's keeping the lights on at the studio. If you say no, you know, we can't get financing from our American distributor, and you know, you're going to put a lot of people out of work. So. The way he described it was they kept guilting him into coming back. Hmm. 
So, uh, uh, you know, and he kept coming back until he just finally said, well, look, I can't, I can't do this anymore. It's getting <laughs> worse and worse and worse. I just, I, I can't, I can't put my name to this. And, and later on, I mean, Christopher Lee starred in some of the worst movies ever made. Oh, yeah. uh, this, this is after Dracula, a- after he, he was done with Dracula, but he still, he just, you know, and I think some of it, some of it was like, he, he did have such a fondness for the character. He didn't want to see the character diminished any further. Right. So his last one was 1973, The Satanic Rites of Dracula. Yeah, it was terrible. Terrible movie. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it truly was. It was a terrible movie. I mean, I, I dare anybody to, to, to really sit through it from beginning to end and, and tell me, oh, no, no, this, this was a very underrated film, which I, see, which I see some people on the Internet saying. People on the Internet are saying, well, Dracula A.D. 1972 is a bad movie, which it is. It's, it's terrible. It, it fails on every level. <laughs> uh, but, but but Dracula, the satanic rites of Dracula, at least it's better than that baloney. It's okay. not. It's not. <laughs> it, is, it, it is not. I mean, it is so tough to get through that movie because, again, it fails on it fails spectacularly on every level, and it adds levels that the previous one didn't have. Oh wow. Okay. Um. So so of of the uh of the how, how many did you say seven seven Christopher Lee Dracula movies yeah. Uh, we've ruled out the last two, but if somebody's like, give me, give me uh, the one to watch. Which one would you recommend? I would say there are four to watch. Okay, there are four worth watching. Um, there's the original Horror of Dracula. There's the the first sequel that Christopher Lee was in, which was Dracula: Prince of Darkness. His the one right after that is to me that that it's it's terrific. It's called Dracula Has Risen from the Grave. Um, and that, that co-stars for me, uh, probably the most beautiful woman to ever grace a hammer production of uh, her name is Veronica Carlson. Okay. Um, she's terrific. The story is very, very personal and it, it's got, it's got substance and it's, it's about a topic that, you know, is still relevant today. It's about faith versus science. It's, a, it's about, you know, how much do we put our faith in God versus how much do we, you know, put our faith in science and ourselves? You know, that's something that continues to this day. It, it's a really good story with a, with a compelling lead actor. Really like that one a lot. Uh, you could skip the other one, the, the <laughs> one right after that. The one right after that is called Taste the Blood of Dracula. That, that, that's a real lame But the one after that, which has been unfairly maligned for, for 40 years now, it's a movie called Scars of Dracula. Okay. And and it's Christopher Lee. It it breaks from the continuity. All the all of the the, the ones previous had like an ongoing continuity that one would lead into the next one. Uh-huh. This one this one broke from that. It's a standalone. I just watched it on Blu-ray a couple of weeks ago with my daughter. And um of the Hammer films, I would say that one um feels the most akin to Stoker. Other than the original, interesting. Which, yeah, yeah, I, I I like that one a lot. So you know what's kind of fascinating to me about about the Hammer films, which you know, which which to a large extent, as as it pertains to these characters, they picked up the torch from Universal and kept it going. Uh, the 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 Dracula films zeroed in on Christopher Lee, and he really he made a meal out of it. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> I think the Frankenstein films are fascinating for the fact that they 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 realize they couldn't compete with Karloff, and so they're like, you know, what, we're just going to follow the Doctor, right, right, which is really interesting. Um, and they were lucky because you know they had in the Doctor they had Peter Cushing, right, who was terrific. I mean, he was a terrific. Uh, he was great as a as a as a heavy, and he was great as a as a villain. Uh, excuse me, as a hero, he was a terrific Von Helsing. If you watch Horror of Dracula, you see all these different shades. He's he's uh, very clinical and very authoritative, and yet when there's this little girl who's been terrorized by uh, the woman that she used to call Aunt Lucy, you see how compassionate and warm and charming he could be. Peter Cushing, he was terrific, right. um, and. Um, he was he was he was great as as Victor Frankenstein um, with with um, uh, Christopher Lee. I mean, you know, the funny thing is, is at one point Hammer was going to Hammer tried to replace Peter Cushing as uh, Frankenstein in a movie called um, uh, Horror of Frankenstein. It came out in 1970. I think it was the same year as as Scars of Dracula. I think they were on a double bill. And they replaced Peter Cushing with an actor named Ralph Bates. Okay. 
And Ralph Bates at one point was going to replace Christopher Lee as Dracula as well. And um, uh, nothing against Ralph Bates. I mean, I, I don't have anything you know personally, personally or professionally against them. <laughs> but 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 horror of Frankenstein did so poorly that that when when Hammer did another Frankenstein movie, they just brought Peter Cushing back and pretended that horror never happened. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, and and with with the Dracula case. Um, Again, Hammer realized that they would not get financing if they didn't have Christopher Lee in the movie. So they put Ralph Bates in, and you can see you can see almost like the the architecture of the movie that Ralph Bates was going to take over the role of Dracula. And but they got Peter, they got Christopher Lee back at the last minute, and so Christopher Lee steps in and basically kicks Ralph Bates out of the movie. <laughs> and that's a, that's a movie called Taste the Blood of Dracula. Okay, and. And um, it, he, he just, he would have been, he, he was, he was a lousy, he was a lousy Victor Frankenstein. He would have been an awful Dracula. That's, I'm just thinking that it, it, that's sort of like if, if Diamonds Are Forever started with, with Sean Connery smacking George Lazenby before, before stepping in, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, I, we, you know, if, if we got a minute, I mean, I mean, the, the, the premise of, of, I think the original premise, my understanding of the original premise of Taste the Blood of Dracula, Dracula was that it was going to pick up from the previous, it was going to pick up from the previous film, and the, they introduced this Ralph Bates character, and he was going to find Dracula's ashes, and in the satanic ritual, he was going to consume the ashes and basically be possessed by the spirit of Dracula. Interesting. So it would be, it would be Ralph Bates's face, but he would be Dracula in spirit. I see. And they would continue on from there. Uh, and and supposedly the same thing was going to happen with Scars of Dracula if Christopher Lee didn't agree to come back for that one. That's part of the reason why it was a standalone movie um, was they would have cast somebody else and it could have been Ralph Bates again or it could have been another actor. But the at that point, Christopher Lee was a, was an international powerhouse as the in the role and Hammer knew it and Christopher Lee knew it. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, if 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 he's willing to come back, then you get him to come back again. It, it just it, just to continue that metaphor, it's like if you've got access to Sean Connery as James Bond, you get Sean Connery as James Bond, right? And if Leonard Nimoy is willing to come back as Spock, you don't leave him dead, <laughs> right? Exactly. So okay, so we're we're into the seventies here, and this is where I want to bring in uh, one of uh, I think both of our favorite interpretations of Dracula, and this is the Marvel comic series. Yes. So, the Tomb of Dracula. So Tomb of Dracula lasted for, for I think, 80 issues. 70. 70 Se- issues. 70 issues. Well, and then you had a couple uh, annual, or like uh, giant size issues or whatever, right? So yeah. We can, so, let's Five say, giant sizes, yes. And, and, and for a time, there was a, a, a sister magazine, a black and white magazine running alongside it called Dracula Lives. There you go. So, so 80 plus, really, if we factor all that stuff in. Right. Um, so... so this this is a series that I experienced uh, only retrospectively, having read about it. I think I think um, first time I read about it was actually no. I so I saw they made an anime of it mm-hmm. uh, in the eighties, and I saw that when I was a kid. I didn't realize it was connected to the comic book. And then later on, uh, there's a book called The Comic Book Heroes by by Gerard Jones and Will Jacobs, mm-hmm. uh, and they have, they went into it in with uh, great detail and this is the, that book i read it in in the 90s and this series was not available and there was there was uh M- marvel was doing magazines at the time and they did a halloween magazine which i believe you were were you involved with that uh i was asked to write the introduction there, actually. okay so that that's this I, I knew i knew the connection here okay so i re- <laughs> see this is we've been friends like since before we were friends <laughs> You know, because because again, you know, back issues were pretty expensive as if you're a mm-hmm. high school kid, and so that was my first chance. That magazine, Halloween magazine, it was like ninety six. I want to say, yeah, that's, that sounds right. Ninety six. Uh, that was my first uh, chance to read, uh, you know, a, a, a couple issues of Tomb of Dracula. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with the series from there. And then they came out with the black and white essential collections. I got those. And then now they have, you know, there's there's hardcover omnibuses, which I have. Uh, this, to me, is, in my mind, uh, my definitive Dracula. And it's it's a version you got to uh, uh, continue on. So, so talk about your experience with that book, uh, both as a reader and then as a creator. 
Okay. Um, I remember my mom bought me one issue that I, I guess I saw it on the newsstand and I wanted and had a Bernie Wrightson cover of Dracula bursting out of his grave and, you know, grabbing a blonde, you know, nubile, you know, young victim, uh, a beautiful blonde woman, you know, why she'd be out in the middle of the night standing on Dracula's (laughs) grave. Yeah. But I remember, I remember getting that. That was my first issue. Um, it was probably not a great issue to start with because it was, it was too deep in and you you really had to be a, a, a long time reader to sort of get, get all the gist. Um, then a few years later, uh, again, I saw I saw an interesting cover. And I asked my mom to get it for me, and it turned out to be the last issue of the series, Dracula number seventy. Wow! Uh, and oddly enough, that was not a bad issue to get in on, because Marv did such a great job. Marv Wolfman, the writer, did such a great job uh, catching you up that. You, you would read the whole story and just get the gist of, of who everybody was and what was going on and what had been going on. He, masterful job of, of writing in that issue. I didn't realize it was the last issue, <laughs> oddly huh. enough. I got to the end and, and I was like, oh, wow, this is terrific. You know, when does the next issue come out? And there wasn't one. <laughs> Um, and not, not for about a year. And then Marvel launched a, a black and white magazine called the, again, called the tomb of Dracula. And I was there from, you know, pretty much, uh, the beginning and, um, it only lasted six issues. Marv quit halfway through because he, he went over to DC comics. And so he couldn't write for Marvel anymore. And after that, um, I started buying all the back issues. I, I, I'm kind of like you, I went back and I said, okay, I, I, I read that one issue with the rights and cover. And, uh, I, I read the last issue and I went, I read the black and whites. I like this so much. I, I want to read the whole thing. And so over the course of maybe four or five years, just basically hunting, you know, through back issues of, of comic book stores, I managed to amass the full collection along with the black and white magazine that, you know, Dracula lives and the annuals and all that. Um, and I was, you know, concurrently picking up all of Dracula's appearances in, in the Marvel books, uh, after his own series was canceled, they were using him as a super villain in, in those books. Uh, like the X Men and the Def- Defenders and Doctor Strange and Thor and all and, that. And and Glenn, uh, by the way, it's worth mentioning here the the behind the scenes reason that Dracula suddenly became part of the Marvel universe in terms of the the comic code and 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 that you know. Oh sure, okay. Well, up until around 1971, 70, 71, the comics code banned the use of vampires, werewolves. Uh, zombies uh, in in horror comics uh, or in any comics uh, that were going to carry the comics code seal of approval. Um, and that dates back to the 1950s when they cracked down on EC comics and basically put that company out of business. Hmm. Um, but in 1971, there was a weakening in the code and, and, and they suddenly allowed vampires and werewolves and the walking dead to to uh, uh, appear in comics. And so Marvel, not, not skipping a beat, launched a whole horror line. So you had Werewolf by Night and, you know, uh, uh, the Frankenstein monster and, and uh, Tales of the Zombie magazine. And, and, and one of the things on the list that Stan Lee said, let's do Dracula, you know. And Stan Lee and Roy Thomas basically plotted that first issue and they gave it to Jerry Conway to write. And and that the book is very interesting when you, when you read it now because it it took because because Marv didn't come on right away right he it was it was it was, a, he was it was like five or six issues I think before he before he took over right two issues by Jerry okay two two issues by Archie Goodwin two issues by Gardner Fox and then Marv takes over with number seven and stays to the very end so so when you read that first let's say you know yeah but let's say the first 10 issues you can tell they the 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 first the first batch they were trying to figure it out right right to to a large extent um there, there were there were certain things that had been there since the very beginning um i actually you know i when i actually spoke to roy uh, not too long ago oh, and nice. we yeah and dracula came up and he he mentioned again that he basically 
plotted that first issue. Hmm. And in a perfect world, he would have gotten credit for it. He was happy. To, he was happy that Jerry, you know, got all the credit uh, that that he deserved because they're you know they're longtime buds. But you know, he he did make it clear that he and did Jerry Conway it. was like a kid at this time, right? I mean, he was about nineteen, twenty. Yeah, man, amazing! What a story he has. That's crazy. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, go on. And, yeah, and and so you know there there were elements that were put in place from the very beginning, which was uh, the the main protagonist was a guy named Frank Drake, who was a descendant of Dracula's. Right. So it's not like the new writer came in and dumped everything that had come before. Frank Drake became a very very important character in that book, and his relationship with Dracula was explored and and so forth. Archie came in and introduced another very, very important character, which was Rachel Van Helsing with yes. num- number three. Right. Rachel became just as important a character as 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 Frank and as Dracula himself. When Marv came in, he introduced Quincy Van Harker. Uh, excuse me, Quincy Harker. Yes. Uh, uh, who is the son of Jonathan and Mina Harker from from the original novel. That's where it really took off. I, my feeling is that, you know, when Mar- Marv hit the ground running with the very first issue, he he just he, he he just you know hit the ground running, and it was all forward momentum from there. Um, the series itself didn't really get its footing get its uh, full footing until Tom Palmer came on as the inker right. with I believe number. 10 or 11. He had, he had inked a few issues before that, starting with number three, he, he would ink a few issues, then he would take a break. And then, but when he started inking regularly, every issue with, I think number 10 or number 11, that's when the team was in place. And then boom, it was no, no looking back. And that series, like I, I, I always, I recommend it to people. I, re- I recommend that book and, and uh, master of Kung Fu from that era, because I think they both uh, excelled at the same kind of thing where, it it's it's a you know it's a serialized quest to to you know to defeat the bad guy right Fu Manchu and in, in Master of Kung Fu Dracula here obviously but um it it reads like you're watching a a television show uh you know and so I always tell people I'm like you have to binge watch these comics. Well, I liken to Dracula to a seventy issue novel. Yeah, From, very yeah, fair. I, yeah. Yeah, that that's that's kind of what I likened it to because if you if you cut away all of the stuff that came after after the, the last issue of the original series, um, you know that you could call that you know the the apocrypha or whatever. Yeah. But but if you if you go with those first seventy issues, even though there there is um, uh, two writers before two two previous writers before the regular writer comes on, it all fits together and it it does work as as a complete novel. And, and the great thing about, you know, the other stuff that the annuals and, and the black and white magazines that we talked about Dracula lives is that it fills in the history. It fills in, you know, the gaps in, in, in the character's backstory. And the first annual, which, which it wasn't called an annual, it was called giant size. Right. The first G- giant size, int- it's called giant size chillers, actually. Um, it introduces a very, very, very important character, uh, Dracula's daughter, Lilith, right. uh, who, who will go on to play a major role um, in, in Dracula's universe. So that whole run from 1972 to 1979, you can look at as a core novel with some sort of like ancillary spinoffs that, that you really should, you know, read. Uh, but anything other than that, even including the thing that I did, is all um, it's it's all extra. It's it's gravy. Sometimes it's gravy that went a little bad, but 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 it's 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 non essential. Uh, but but the the Tomb of Dracula stuff, the stuff that's in the omnibuses that they're now currently printing in um, uh, trade paperbacks, a series of trade paperbacks called the Complete Collection. That's that's the essential stuff. Which man, I'm telling you, like the, this stuff did not exist uh, when when I was growing up in in the in the 80s and 90s, especially in the 90s, and mm-hmm. you know it's 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 this embarrassment of riches now where these great series from that era are available uh, for people to check out. Even even you know the the, the Frankenstein book that that Mike Plug did the art for. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some really good stuff there, which which you know they put that out in an essential book. I think I think maybe 10, 12 years ago, but. 
this is like the seventies is this great era of of Marvel books that I feel like a lot of people don't know about. Once you get past like the you know the the, the superhero stuff, like the, the, right. there were there were there was a lot of experimentation happening there. Yes. Well, well, a lot of it was because it was a it was a survival move because yeah. the comp, the comic book industry was in such dire straits um, throughout the seventies. Um, you know, I think we've talked about this before. The, the one thing that saved Marvel was Star Wars. Right. You know, so they they had to try they had to try all these different genres and different different approaches. Um, and speaking of the Frankenstein thing, you know, Marvel put out a, a trade a color trade paperback a couple of years ago, uh, and it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous having all that stuff in color. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I mean, I remember you know starting at Marvel in nineteen, 19- uh, <laughs> and and I think I think that the fir- the thing that I said on my first day was, hey, when are you guys going to reprint Tomb of Dracula as a Marvel Masterworks collection? You know, mm-hmm. as Marvel Masterwork hardcover volumes, and they were like. You know, we don't we don't have any plans uh, at the moment, huh. and I had to wait about twenty years before the omnibus came came along. At yeah. least ten. So <laughs> yeah, um, I'm glad I'm glad that that it 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 has been uh, uh, reprinted so many times in the last few years, and that in different formats so that people can experience it because it totally is worth experiencing. It's it's uh, for my money, it's still the best single series that marvel has put it has put out uh, uh, an ongoing series with a beginning and a middle and an end well and and that just the mere fact of that that it does have a beginning and middle and an end i think i think now to me that's that's the thing that makes it worthy of recommendation it's like oh you're not signing on for like a hundred hundreds and hundreds of issues you got you got like it's a compact thing like you said it's a novel yeah. Uh, you can you you know and and I think it's a great way to experience it. I think uh, uh, I think uh, to to me you know uh, the it's it's the Marvel book that I think of as sort of like my definitive characterization of Dracula as being complicated and he's you know he's 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 not um, he's not purely the the big bad you know there's 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 layers there that make him really uh, really interesting. And he's got this intricate backstory that that Marv and and, and other writers uh, really fleshed out in in Dracula Lives as they told to, you know stories of his past across the centuries, which which really really I mean that that's the stuff that that for me really made the character you know come to life you know so to speak, um, and you know and I, I mean I don't want to knock all the stuff that came after the original series because Roger Stern in particular did a terrific uh, follow up. Where you know the intent was to put Dracula to bed, you know, once and for all, um, and and that was a terrific story that was very much faithful to what to what Marv had done. And I agree with you because I've I, you know I've I've written uh, a graphic novel which is yet to be illustrated, but I've written a graphic novel which may someday you know be be done, but the writing is done, uh-huh. uh, which is which is done you know to be a a, a sequel to. The novel, the Bram Stoker novel. Okay. And what I found is the influence that Marv Wolfman has on me is huh. so great that I often found myself writing his Dracula instead of Stoker's. <laughs> so I had to really pull back and say, no, 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 no. You're writing, you're doing Marv. You're channeling Marv. You want to channel <laughs> Stoker. Not just, not, which is not to say that, that Marv did not write a, a Dracula that was faithful to Stoker. But Marv's Dracula is so distinct, and there yeah. were so many layers that he added, and I really had to sort of create a line of demarcation in my mind to separate, because otherwise I'm just writing Marv's Dracula. You know? <laughs> and 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 for folks listening, it's worth worth mentioning that the Tomb of Dracula comic series is from whence sprang uh, the character Blade, right? Who, of course, is now considered sort of an iconic Marvel character because of Wesley Snipes and Mahershala Ali is going to be playing him soon. Uh, mm-hmm. Started started as a side character in a Dracula comic, and that issue has now skyrocketed in in value. No, you you sure. look at the the issue before it, affordable. <laughs> the issue after it, affordable. That issue, Dracula, uh, Tomb of Dracula number 10, forget about it. Just forget, <laughs> forget about ever trying to track that one down at, at, a, at a decent price. It probably wow. won't have a cover, you know? Uh, so so in, in the late 90s, you got to, to weave a few more threads into Marvel's Dracula tapestry. Uh, and, and you got to work with uh, Tom Palmer as the inker, right? I think it was Patrick O'Leaf did the art. Yes. So, uh, so you, got, you, got to, you got to talk about this. 
Okay. Well, that that was that was a project that was in my mind before I even got to Marvel. Mm -hmm. I, I'd always I wanted to do something that tied into Tomb of Dracula. And when I got to Marvel and I started building up um, uh, my editorial career and, and and slowly but surely you know tried to like rack up some writing credits as well. So what happened was um, the this was a, this was a project that was four years in the making. Um, I had an idea that I wanted to do when I was playing with the idea of introducing a character who was Dracula's opposite number. So he would have been like to, uh, to goodness what Dracula was to evil. Hmm. He was going to be sort of like the, like an angel. Okay. But we're never going to come out you know, and say you know, for sure that he's an angel from heaven. And so that idea kind of fell by the wayside because uh, ABC TV did a, did a miniseries of The Stand – Stephen King's The Stand. Yeah, I remember that. Rob Lowe was in that. Exactly. And it was really, it was damn, damn good. Yeah, I remember and, that. Yeah, and I was so knocked out by it that I said, I think I've got my Dracula story. Huh. And, and and the premise basically was, what if there was a plague that threatened to wipe out all of humanity, and the only hope that we have is the one guy who, A, would survive, and B, needs us if he wants to keep surviving? So what about a story where Dracula saves the world huh. and for purely selfish reasons? And so that was where the, the genesis of, of that idea came. So this was around 1994 and I kept refining the story and figuring out where to go with it and, and, and how to, how to, you know, put it all together. And I just, you know, it took, it took a long time to find an editor who was, um, you know, able to, you know, sponsor it and, and get it through, you know, Marvel's editorial system. And I was very lucky in that I had an advocate in a guy named Tim Toohey, who was a terrific editor. Um, I, I suggested Pat Olive as the penciler uh, because, uh, well, Gene Colan wasn't, um, Gene Colan was actually doing a Dracula project for Dark Horse at the oh, time. With, interesting. With, with, with Marv Wolfman. So I asked for Pat Olive, who did an adaptation of Frankenstein that was just brilliant. Uh, he did a terrific job. So I knew he could do horror. And I'd been working with Pat for a long time on Untold Tales of Spider-Man. So this is a guy with a lot of versatility, just really, really versatile. Yeah. So I knew, I knew he could do horror. And Tom Palmer was a, was a, it was just a no-brainer. Just a no-brainer. You're going to do Dracula. You're going <laughs> to do, do Pat Olive trying to channel you know, not not copy Gene Colan, but try to channel it. Tom Palmer's, you got to have him. And luckily, Tom was willing to come aboard. And it was a pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure. And like I said, for me, it was it was four years in the making. And so for me, it was just, you know, it just burst out of me at that mm. point. You know, I'm, you know, we're really doing it for sure. And it just flowed out of me and seeing the pages come in. I still have all of my Xeroxes of Pat's pencils, huh. you know, wow. And, and he just did such, such a fantastic job. Um, I should, I should, you know, make copies for you and send, send them to you sometime. Oh, that'd be and, awesome. Yeah. You could see what it, what it looked like in the, in the pencils. Uh, he knocked himself out. He, he was just fantastic. And I own two pages of, of the original artwork. Um, so this was really a labor of love for me. And, it, you know, and it's one of those things where you go back and it's like there's a few lines of dialogue that I kind of wince at. And I wish I wish I could go in and change them now because I think I'm a much better writer now. <laughs> uh, but overall, it it really it really was what I wanted it to be. I think I could do a better job now, but I don't sort of like wince at it and say, ooh. I mean, like I said, a few lines of dialogue here and there. But I really. uh I, I, I'm really proud of the way it turned out. Uh, and the, and was, that was like 99, right? Uh, 98. 98. Uh, fall, of, uh, fall of 98. Fall of 98. So I, I remember very distinctly going to the comic book shop. Uh, I was working for my college paper at the time. So I had, you know, there was a comic store. I was It was like production day. So I would go on Wednesday because Wednesday was our production day. So I would okay. take, a, take my break, go to the comic shop. It was like a mile away and, and I whatever was new. And I remember picking this up. And I'm like, oh, what's this? And then, and then. I was already a Dracula, a Marvel Dracula fan. Then I open it up and I see your name in the credits and I'm like, 
ah, perfect. I remember him liking Dracula from before. Oh, cool. You know? Yeah. No, I, I loved it, you know, and, and, and Pat loved it. And Tom, Tom was great. Tom was like, you know, as, as the vet, as the Dracula vet, you know, he, he was able to like, you know, offer insights. And I remember he, 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 he called it, you know, when we were working on the first issue, there was this one scene where, you know, Dracula does this heinous thing and I'm building up to it. It takes like a, a page or two to build up for the, for the payoff. And, you know, Palmer called to tell me, he goes, you know, I'm reading this script, you know, and, and I'm just like, you know, it's like, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Boom, it happened. I'm like, but this Greenberg, he's really got something to it. You know, hey. it's like, I'm, I'm hearing this from Tom Palmer. It was, it was just. Yeah, it was just, it was incredible. You know, and Ralph Macchio, who had written a, a ter- you know, he was my uh, co-editor, at, you know, he was my colleague at Marvel, a fellow editor at Marvel, and he was also a terrific writer, and he, he wrote one of the, the black and white Dracula magazines. He wrote a very, very good story that um, I shamelessly cribbed from, but I told <laughs> him about it. He was, you know, he, to this day, if the Dracula, you know, thing comes up, he goes, and Glenn, I want to tell you, he goes, you did such a good job on that Dracula series. And it's just great to hear, you know, yeah. it's, I don't think I measured up at all to what Marv did. I, I, I think that, you know, I don't think, I really don't think anybody was able to capture fully what Marv did. Roger Stern probably came the closest, but for what I could do, for what I could add to the, to the, uh, to the canon, uh, I'm, I'm just glad that I got the opportunity to do it. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. Yeah. Well, and, and you get to be part of that canon. So that's, you know, that's something no one can ever take away from you. So I think that's pretty sweet. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so we are running a little bit out of time. So as we wrap things up, what, uh, in, you know, I, I, I'd say in a broad sense, what is the secret of the character's longevity? But I think we, we've established some of that. Uh, what would, what yeah. would you like to see done differently with the character in the future? What are, what are some, you know, there've been so many iterations. What have we not seen of Dracula that I think that you think is, is worth uh, doing? My feeling is, I mean, despite you know, the Coppola movie being called Bram Stoker's Dracula. Right. It really did deviate from the novel in some fundamental ways. And what I'd like to see is if you're going to do Dracula again, if you're going to do another adaptation, I think the big twist is do the freaking book, you know, <laughs> don't reinterpret Dracula as a tragic hero. Dracula is supposed to be a personification of evil, you know, and if you can update the story and you can, you know, and in fact, I mean, for me, probably the most, most faithful version of the novel is the BBC miniseries from the late seventies with Louis Jordan, huh. who was who not ideal casting, but he, he turned in a hell of a performance. And if that could be done on a, on a big budget, where you've got the kind of production values that that Coppola had, but you're doing the novel the way Stoker envisioned it, where he is this, he's like a, he's like a pestilence, he's a virus, he's an invader, you know, he he he's evil, um, and and you don't you don't make him a sympathetic character. You don't make him a tragic figure. Hmm. Um, I think that that, that is something I'd like to see. And, and I, you know, I'm not opposed to doing a sequel, you know, to, I'm not opposed to seeing a sequel to the novel, but I think that the, the thing that keeps getting missed is they don't adhere to Stoker, you know, right. let's get rid of the whole Dracula can't walk around in the daylight nonsense. You know, he can, he's just not at his peak, yeah. you know? So let's, 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 let's play with that. And, and, you know, let's, let's stick to the character. And one of the things that, that annoyed me was, uh, they came out with a novel that was, uh, uh, that was billed as the first official sequel to Dracula. And the first thing that it did was dispense the original Dracula huh. and say, that didn't happen the way you thought it did here. And what did they do? They basically went with the Coppola version where he's, oh, again, okay. where he and me are these ancient lovers and like, get that out of here. You know, it's, <laughs> Let's get back. You know, good and evil still exist in the world. Let's let's not let's not make evil sympathetic. You know. Well, I think I think that's that's a perfect summation of uh, the enduring appeal of the character. He he is evil, and it is about seeing uh, evil dispatched and and sort of that primal struggle that keeps people coming back to to Dracula and 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 he embodies the allure of evil. Right. Uh, you know. Yeah, uh, evil should be seductive and 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 all that, but but ultimately it's something that uh, we should oppose it and not feel sorry for it. Yeah. 
Well, there we go. I I I, I wasn't uh, prepared to cover so much ground about this character, but I got to admit it was it was just absolutely fascinating uh, hearing your insights uh, about him. And I think everyone listening is familiar with Dracula in some way, so I think they will all come out uh, just as just as engaged as I was. So thank you, Glenn, for for coming on and and holding forth about this character. Thank you, Zaki, for letting me go on and on and on about him. I love it. Well, you're, you're, you know you have an open forum here to go on and on and on about whatever you like. So I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping that we'll, we'll uh, make some time real soon to, to do this again. Sure. Uh, and, and of course, if, if folks are, are looking for Glenn, I know, I know that you're on Facebook and, and uh, you, you have a Twitter account, right? Yeah, uh, at Glenn L. Greenberg, uh, two ends in Glenn. There you go, folks. Hit him up. And uh, you can find me at my website, ZakiesCorner.com. That's the A-K-I-S Corner. That's also my Twitter. That's also my Instagram. You can also find my writing at the San Francisco Chronicle, where I've got some fun stuff coming up, including a, uh, a, a look at some of the best uh, Simpsons Halloween special segments. So uh, look for that soon and look for the next episode of this show. Thanks once again to my guest, Glenn Greenberg, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Catch you next time. Now the monster mash And it's a graveyard smash It's caught on in a flash It's now the monster mash Now everything's cool, Jack's a part of the band And my monster mash is the hit of the land For you, the living, this mash was meant to When you get to my door, tell them more they send you Then you can monster mash and do my graveyard smash You'll catch on in a flash Then you can monster man